Figure it out. Hello, this is Adam Carlick with Flying and Eating. Today, let's go somewhere and do something. And make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hey everyone, it's Adam here. On the last episode of Flying and Eating, we went out to Guam. We've had all sorts of adventures, eating a bunch of random stuff, driving all around the island, and frankly, just lounging by the beach. But today, we're heading over to the airport because there's a new adventure. Good morning, everyone. It is day five here on Guam, and I am actually leaving Guam temporarily. I'm heading over to the CNMI, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, another part of the United States that is only accessible via Guam. Specifically, we're going to Saipan. I probably should have mentioned that we are at GUM, GUM, Guam. Uh, this is Antonio B. Juan Airport. Uh, perfectly nice airport. But at this time of the morning, it's only like 4.30 in the morning, dead. <laughs> Nobody here. I am through security, no problems. Uh, now I'll head over to my gate. Something to keep in mind about uh, this airport, again, again, it is American, so things like TSA pre-check work here. There is no clear section. Not a problem, there's not usually that many people here, but it depends. If you're checking your bags, you want to be here early, trust me. I am not, so it's not a problem. Plus, ironically, I'm in one of the, I'm the only domestic flight because every other flight they go to, except for Honolulu, is international, so that always causes problems. But uh, Saipan and Honolulu are the only two domestic flights from here because they're the only parts of the U.S. that are accessible from here. But just to give you guys a quick look around, there's basically that section and that section and a very cool little store in there with lots of kitschy stuff and you know your usual duty freeze and all that sort of stuff it's a cool airport so uh gum is an interesting airport because it is an american airport and technically it's also not that very, it's not that big so it has a lot of domestic flights to saipan and to honolulu which is pretty much what this is this is a stopping point because they want to do a little bit of a filter before they let you go to other parts of the u.s because territories you know rules are complicated we're not going into that but you see how there's like a barrier in the center um, these barriers come down and these type of ropes change depending on the time of the day because then flights start going to other international destinations like South Korea and Japan and so on and so forth so they've timed all the flights around which ones are gonna be domestic and which ones are gonna be international it's it's like a transforming airport I don't know how else to put it it's, it's kind of bizarre perfect example of what I mean they have these signs set up for those specific times if you're arriving from hawaii or saipan which is both american and you're staying on guam you're good this is one lane domestic everything else customs international all that sort of stuff so uh, because i didn't come through japan i can't show you the international section because when i land from saipan back here because i have no choice i'm gonna go through the same place i came in from hawaii so i did a little research into this because it's fundamentally odd that united airlines specifically has such a big presence out here so it turns out there's a reason for it um, before United Airlines had control of this place, because th there's a rule in the United States, which is that all parts of America have to have some measure of cover, meaning they have to be accessible to all parts of America, even if that's very limited, which is why American Samoa in particular is very challenging to get to. However, Guam is much more uh, strategically valuable, and it has a much bigger population, so there's a real effort there. Now, United is here because Continental used to be here. United absorbed Continental, so they inherited these routes. But Continental only had them because Northwest Airlines had them, and <laughs> Continental absorbed Northwest Airlines. And Northwest Airlines only had them because they absorbed the local air like carrier that used to exist here. So it's just the beast getting bigger, if you will, is the only real reason uh, that United is here. But it's very interesting because um, they treat it as a hub to basically bring in a ton of Asian tourists from everywhere, but it's also this cool little back door to America because if you're in Japan or anything like that uh, you have the option to fly directly here via United Airlines or uh, the Philippines I believe they can fly here directly um, it, but because airlines also have a rule where in case you're ever curious about this airlines have a rule where um, or well I should say international law basically prevents an airline from operating uh, between countries it's not from so for example American Airlines cannot fly a route from say Canada to the UK uh, so th they have to, the end point or beginning point has to be in the country. But since Guam is American, it allows uniquely United Airlines to operate throughout Asia <laughs> as long as it treats Guam as a hub. So technically, if you were a person in Japan and you wanted to fly to, say, Manila, you actually have the option to fly United Airlines the entire time by just going from Tokyo to Guam to Manila. 
I just think it's kind of fascinating. Um, and it's it's more and Guam became the hub instead of say the uh, CNMI only because frankly there's vastly more people here. So I made it. I am now on Saipan in the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. About to go rent a car, which I already set up. Uh, I had to deal with, you know, it's not really customs because you are, I'm an American citizen, you're coming from another part of America, but because they're territories they have these extra filters and of course we're in a pandemic so there's extra stuff. So now the sun is coming up. I have my rental car back there and I'm going to show you some highlights of Saipan. It's because I've actually, I can't believe I'm saying this, this is my third time here. First time was just on a whim. I was in Guam and I thought, quick round trip. I'll go over there, I'll check it out for a day, and pretty much this is as far as I ever got because I didn't rent a car. So there was a little restaurant that's as far as I could get because I only had like two hours between the flight because it was super cheap, but it was just like, it's a technical touchdown, that's all I want. Second time I was ever here was my buddy Matt was with me and he was like, why don't we actually explore it? So we rented a car and we actually did the whole island. So thankfully we did that because now I have like highlights I can give you. Uh, but the first thing I'm going to show you here is something kind of special. This is an actual Japanese World War II era bunker. The thing about Saipan in particular is its entire history is, hey, remember World War II? That happened here. That's, that's what it's known for. Um, there's these actual just, like, legit... They're mostly filled with trash, unfortunately, now. But these are like the actual bunkers the Japanese would fight in uh, until the end of the war. I'll show you a lot more of this stuff, but yeah, you're gonna see a lot of stuff. It's not happening right now, obviously, but next to it is, these are just soccer fields. Like, these things are so common, they just put sporting events next to them. So I thought I'd give a little bit of history about why the United States even owns these particular islands. Like, yes, we got them from the Japanese after the war, but it's actually a little more complicated than that. Like all the islands in the area, at one time it was completely controlled by indigenous peoples. And then naturally, the Europeans showed up. Uh, specifically, the Spanish came, uh, and they colonized and conquered and did all that. But at the end of the 1800s, around like 1898, I think it was, the Spanish-American War was going on, and it was pretty obvious to the Spanish they were going to lose to the United States. Uh, so this, these islands would have come under the possession of the United States back then. Uh, but in an effort to kind of stop that from happening, the Spanish basically sold the islands to Germany. And Germany had absolutely no interest in them. They just were kind of like, we'll do you a solid and technically claim these. That way the United States would not inherit the islands in the event of victory. But in the 14, 15 years or so that Germany had the islands, they did nothing with them. They never sent an expedition even. Like, they never came here. Uh, it's just that technically from abroad they claim, yeah, those are ours. Uh, in 1914, the Japanese invaded the island and Germany's response was, okay. <laughs> and so Japan owned the islands from 1914 until 1945 when, at the end of the Second World War, the U.S. took possession and formalized it as a territory and here we are. So out there in the distance you can actually see cargo ships. Uh, there's this weird old rule about how Guam is not allowed to import cargo from other countries, but the CNMI is. So as a result, um, CNMI has to filter everything going into Guam unless it's coming in from other parts of the U.S. So one of our first stops here is referred to as the Old Japanese Jail. Uh, at some point, basically before and during the war, Japan used this uh, to basically hold people, hold prisoners. Um, they actually make a claim of the possibility that Amelia Earhart was at one time possessed here. I don't personally believe that, but that's, that's what they say. Um, but yeah, we'll go take a quick look inside. Uh, but yeah, there you go. The remnants of a Japanese prison. Uh, this is where they would have held people in the cells and all of that. You can see some of the actual, like, barbed wire, well, the, the, the cage, what have you. But yeah, these, <laughs> one time, I mean, we'll talk about inhumane, but uh, yeah, this at one time was used for exactly that purpose. Now it's just a, a neat little remnant type of thing that I thought you guys would get a kick out of if you're at all into World War II history. Because that's, honestly, guys, that's, that's Saipan's thing. It's like, 
It's, oh, remember the war? That happened here. That's mostly what it's known for. This one in particular looks like it held up a little bit better over time. It still has the over part. Um, but yeah, you can see inside. Looks nice, relatively speaking. Um, it's, I guess when I say nice, I mean, it hasn't completely fallen apart, let's put it that way. Welcome to American Memorial National Park on Saipan. Uh, representing the area of the part of the world that we are in. We go up here, we can see that we were just on Guam, and we are now here on Saipan. Um, and all of that, that string there, is all American territory. And you can see, relatively speaking, its proximity to Japan. Take a quick look around the park. First time I was in this park, actually, it was really funny. Um, we saw these kids walking around and, you know, they looked like they were going to start interacting with us, and then we realized they weren't. They What they were doing was playing Pokemon Go. It's like, yes, they are Americans. <laughs> like, that's exactly what American kids would be doing. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's, it's a nice little park, uh, very clean, a lot of locals come out, and, you know, they go running and exercising and, you know, all that sort of stuff. You know, the stuff that healthy people, unlike me, do. Um, back there, that's kind of the downtown area, if you will, the most populated area of the island, or let's say the populous area, uh, but that's where, you know, all the major hotels and all that stuff is right along there. Um, the CNMI is not very populated. I think this island in particular, Saipan, has the largest population at only around 60,000 people. Um, the, the thing, like I keep saying, it's best known for is World War II. I mean, I'm not going to it, but the other couple of islands like Rhoda and uh, Tinian, uh, Tinian in particular is known very well because it's where the uh, Enola Gay took off to drop the nuclear weapons on Japan. Um, so, yeah, this is all very World War II centric. This whole section basically has, you know, names of soldiers and people that fought and died. And, of course, flags honoring all of them. Yeah, just, you know, your World War II memorials, what can I say? As I walk along here in what is still the United States, yet halfway around the world. I'm kind of just reminded, like, everybody remember, if you're an American, your country is a lot bigger than you seem to think it is. It's got a lot of options for you to go visit and go check out parts of the country you've probably never seen before. Um, and if you're in this part of the world, uh, not only do you have options like Guam and CNMI, you actually have the other three countries in the area that are actually not part of the U.S., but are in what's called a compact of free association with the United States. Those countries being Palau, uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, and the Marshall Islands. All three of which used to be U.S. territories, uh, but the U.S. gave them independence in exchange for keeping some land for base purposes, as the U.S. tends to do, um, but also an agreement of the U.S. will continue to financially aid these countries that can't really function on their own, but also American citizens have the right to go to those countries land and you never have to leave. You don't have a 90-day temporary stay. You can just land and live there. Uh, the only one of the three I've been to is the Federated States of Micronesia. I went to Yap specifically with my mom a few years ago. Really cool. But it's, so Americans, like I said, your country is bigger than you think and you even have other countries you can just go into and just live there indefinitely. So here they have like the tour building. If you go in there, they have like a big, you know, amphitheater that just shows you a movie about World War II and every, the battles that were fought here. This is what I was talking about before with the tanks underwater. If I actually see this somewhere, I'll show it to you, but otherwise you guys might have to settle for that. Uh, but yeah, there's bunkers everywhere. Currently, we went to the Japanese jail. Currently we're here and we came in over there and it was only a few minutes to get there. It is not a big island. So here you have a whole bunch of uh, the World War II history, of course, about uh, what life was like here before the Americans uh, and then eventually the war itself. And, you know, the, yeah, <laughs> you understand. But uh, we have our little 3D model here. Let's, let's go around to an angle that will make more sense. Um, so this is Saipan. This is where we are currently. Um, this is where the, the suicide cliff and all that, we'll take a look at all that stuff. Uh, I believe we landed over here and we've been driving around and yeah. And, uh, this is Tinian. We'll take a look at that real quick. Tinian, we will not be going to, but this is the island where 
uh, the Enola Gay took off. So the atomic bombs came from this island. Uh, yeah. You can see all this history of the battles. But you can see the proximity to, like, here's where we are, and that's where Japan is. So all of this used to belong to Japan, and this was American. So after the during the war, Japan conquered Guam, and after the war, this all became American. Uh, and Iwo Jima is where Japan now begins. Uh, yeah. And of course, it all kind of have been there actually many times, but for this extent of Japanese occupation, people tend to forget. The Japanese actually conquered a couple of American islands in the war, but they were all Alaskan islands. I mean, in addition to Guam, obviously. But, uh, yeah, it's just a, a neat thing to see all of this. Yeah, they got this little audio show set up. This is a super cool, and then they have history of the Battle of the Philippines. People tend to forget this. At the time of the war, the Philippines was part of the United States. Um, yeah, every time I've come, it's weird to say that I've come in here multiple times, but every time I have, they always ask me like, hey, have you ever been here before? Do you, we have a movie, do you wanna watch it? Which, I've seen the movie, so I don't really need to see it again. It's not like I can show you guys, but it's, it's literally all of this condensed into a film. Highly recommended if you're ever out here. This is definitely something to do. Very cool, lots of, Lots of neat World War II stuff. Again, if you're into World War II history, that's that's pretty much the biggest thing Saipan has going for it. Uh, this is the uh, suicide and bonsai cliffs. We'll be taking a look at that later. Like, we're actually going to go there. Um, and then eventually, US-1, Japan surrendered and turned it over to us. And we've been allies ever since. The Battle for Tinian, which is a whole different matter, as well as Rota. And uh, the other northern islands, which we're not going to any of those, but the big one, aside from Guam, obviously, was Saipan itself. Yeah. And then, of course, it's got information about how the war ended, you know, atomic bombs, and... Yeah, it was... Uh... There you go. Information, people who fought, all that. Actually... You know what's really cool? This is, you remember the state quarters collection? The territory's got them too. I remember I found this exact quarter, like obviously the real quarter size, but yeah, that quarter is this part. It is right here. Those flags over there is the flags on that quarter. So if you ever see it, you also saw it there. And then post-war recovery, building, unification, all that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, peace between the peoples. If you guys were curious what a license plate here looks like, boom, there you go. Much like Guam, Saipan has some really nice beaches. So this place is kind of dead currently because pandemic, and to be fair, it's also like really early in the morning. But this would be like your epicenter of shopping. Uh, you would go here, there's a mall there, like the Galleria, like the ones in Guam. They have the stereotypical I Heart Saipan stores are over there. Uh, as well as over here, there's actually an ABC store, which is a big thing in Hawaii and in Guam. Uh, that's where you could buy like a can of coffee or something like that, which is actually sounds pretty good. I think I'm gonna go do that. This is depressing. Like this had a nice map on it, but as you can see, it has a giant thing. It says space for rent. I don't think that's meant to be as symbolic as it somewhat comes off like. One thing you might notice when you're in Guam is you'll see a lot of Bank of Hawaii. And when you're in the other territories like CNMI or even the former territories, like um, uh, Federated States of Micronesia, you'll see a lot of Bank of Guam. It's like they're always just trying to advance up to the next level. Other thing that's interesting around this area, you'll notice on a lot of these buildings, a lot of stuff is in Mandarin, or Cantonese, I'm sorry, a, a version of the Chinese language. Um, because this place uniquely appeals to the Chinese. This is a little messed up, but because they're territories, they can run their rules slightly differently on immigration. Uh, and so I did a lot of, I've looked into this, and apparently it's pretty common. CNMI has two rules that kind of create a logical paradox. One of those rules is, unlike every single other part of the United States, the CNMI uniquely allows Chinese citizens to visit without a visa, meaning they can just show up, and that's fine, like you can in a lot of countries. The other issue it, it has is, unlike every other part of the U.S., it also does not require you to leave. 
Um, so a Chinese citizen can legally fly directly to Saipan, clear customs without a visa, and just stay indefinitely. So this leads to another issue, if you want to call it that, which is, I, I would say it's just a result, which is if a person from China lands here and stays, they can have a kid and the kid can grow up and as soon as the kid is 18, they can request that their parents get, get citizenship. And so there is a long game here for a lot of Chinese people to become U.S. citizens. They basically spend two decades here to accomplish that. We will get our morning coffee fix here. While I did buy coffees down at ABC store, um, those are for later during the drive. For right now, this is for me to enjoy myself. So I got an almond caramel honey bread. I thought this would be small, <laughs> but you know, for some comparison's sake, <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> but I'm totally cool with that because, you know, fat. So I guess the obvious thing to compare it to would be a French toast, but it's not the same. It's really good. Um, I've never had anything quite like it. That's the closest thing I can say. But yeah, no, this is, this is solid. I'm trying to figure out how to phrase this. A French toast is usually cooked in eggs, right? I don't know how they did this. But usually that's the base of an egg is it's, you know, the, or the base of a French toast is it's cooked in an egg. This feels like it was fried without an egg in a sweet bread covered in honey, uh, this cream and um, almonds. It's really good. It's, it's, it, like I said, it's kind of like a French toast, but it is definitely different. Helped protect sea turtles. I agree. We are at uh, Pow Pow. I assume that's how you pronounce that. Pow Pow Beach. And uh, I guess you can do like volleyball stuff there. And under normal conditions, I'm sure you could uh, go swimming and all that. But I thought I'd just give you guys a nice look at the water. Yeah. The water here, just like Guam, is super clean and clear looking. It's, it's, it's just one of those paradise type of places, man. And as you can see, no people, which is always wonderful. <laughs> so here we have an old Japanese base from the war. I mean, look, you can see in the remnants of an actual tank, uh, various bits of artillery, like the cannons and all that. Some big, crazy cool stuff. And we'll, you can go up there too. We'll take a look up in there in this little like bunker they had built. But uh, yeah, this is, if you're into World War II history at all, you know, the last command post, I believe this is where Japan made its final stand uh, in the war effort. Uh, well, for this island, obviously, specifically. Um, but yeah, we'll go up there and take a look. So from on high, this is what you can see. And uh, the little bunkers, which you can totally go into uh, back there, but probably not going to bother. Uh, and then it has this railing that I'm pretty sure the railing is more modern just for safety purposes. But you can see all around. And there's a couple of uh, parks and stuff nearby. Actually, there's a Korean Memorial Park over there. Uh, yeah, lots of, lots of stuff. But like I said... Pretty much all associated with World War II. I changed my mind. We're going inside the little bunker. And you come up out of here. This is where troops would have been stationed. And they would have had, you know, made these holes they could see out of. Probably artillery damage from battleships and stuff. Yeah, it's kind of amazing that it's still in this relatively good of shape, all things considered. So I am now at Suicide Cliff, um, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, towards the end of the war, when the U.S. was taking back this place, you've probably even possibly seen old footage of this, uh, a lot of the Japanese that were living here uh, decided to just kill themselves rather than surrender. And I don't even mean troops, unfortunately, I also mean the general population. Uh, they had been taught uh, by the Japanese government that, hey, the Americans are going to come here, and when they come here, they're going to really mess you up. They're going to do horrible things to you, and it's really just better to off yourself. Which, of course, we didn't do those types of things, but it's a war. It's what happens. But as, as messed up as it is, what you're seeing here is that old footage where people are jumping off these hills. This is where they were going. Obviously, this railing wasn't there. This was built by the Americans. But, um, yeah, the Japanese would just run off those and dive down there. Very, very sad. But uh, this is also the point of the island. We're going to head down there a little bit. I know it's going to be windy. I'm sorry. 
we're gonna head down there and I'll show you guys some more beach views and things like that. Actually, specifically, we're gonna head over there. Uh, there's some really good views over there. But this is the top of Saipan. And it's uh, got a nice memorial and all that sort of stuff now. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's an intense place to be. Look at it, uh, Saipan, from another angle up here. If it weren't for the specific history of this particular area, this would actually just be a really beautiful place to look at. I mean, just look how amazing that looks. Welcome to Bonsai Cliff. I'm no expert on this, but I'm fairly certain this was Japan's last stand, the last piece of soil that was actually held by Japan before the U.S. completely took it. Um, because of the countries having very good relations now, this is now basically like a Japanese memorial park on U.S. soil. Uh, it's pretty cool, actually, and that was where we just were a cliff a bit ago, and you can see down here. So... It's one of these things where it's just kind of like, why, why did we, why did we do this? <laughs> like, why did we have this horrible war? But uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's. I mean, again, if it weren't for the specific history of it, I mean, what a beautiful place. I mean, just look at that. That's amazing. We can go back up here. The first time I was here in this specific memorial. It was before the pandemic, and this this is a very popular spot for Japanese tourists in particular, for obvious reasons. A lot of Chinese tourists come here, and just tourists in general. But given that really only American citizens can come here currently, mostly, I am by myself. There is nobody here except for one lone guard. Every one of these spots that they consider to be significant culturally has a guard on duty just in case anybody has questions or frankly if anybody wants to do something stupid. Now I cannot read Japanese so I don't know what these say in particular but just like the ones above up on the cliff I imagine it's just you know nice peaceful type of things memorials as one would expect. And there's a lot of them. I, I don't know the specifics of any of these in particular I apologize for that um, but I, I know last time I was here Right here in this spot, there were Japanese people just standing right there doing the bonsai thing, uh, which is often misunderstood in the West as like a sign of aggression, but here it's more of a, it's more of a sign of respect. As we drive past these, I thought it might be kind of interesting to point out this spot here, the bonsai cliffs, I believe this is actually the closest ge geographical point between what is the United States and what is Japan. Though to be technical, there's more islands north of here that are part of the CNMI, but none of them are populated. Very nice little welcome sign. Ironically, nowhere near any of the entry points, but it is very close to Bird Island, which is a common tourist destination. So I've been driving around for a while, and it's kind of similar to the U.S. Virgin Islands in that it's, it's kind of interesting to drive here. I feel like kind of at peace, even though I really hate driving in general. Um, but it's, it's interesting to drive here because there's basically no one operating except for like closer to the airport, it, the traffic was legit real. But outside of that, when you're just cruising around and all the sights and the nature, there's nobody out here. Um, so again, I just want to remind my fellow Americans, this is your country. Go live in it. This is Bird Island. I mean, look at that view. That's amazing. I just hope you guys enjoy that. There's also a, uh, a trail you can take and go hiking and walking around, although we're not going to do all that. I just wanted to give you guys this view because I knew that this was a good one. After you leave Bird Island, you can go this way. There's a cave up ahead, um, but as you can see, the road kind of stops. Uh, my buddy Matt and I did this a couple of years ago, and we went way too far into the dirt road and learned our lesson. Yeah, don't do that. Pretty much where this concrete road ends, I would not recommend driving beyond it. So now, I'm gonna head back into town and maybe try to find something to eat. Google recommended this place, the Agri Pen, or Penny, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, this is right next to the American National Park, which by the way, there's free parking there all day. So if you ever need parking when you go into town, I kinda recommend that. Um, unfortunately, this place is closed. And yes, you see a dispensary there because weed is completely legal in both Guam and the CNMI. Google recommended this place, Sura Korean Restaurant. I've got barbecue, lobster, yepin yaki, and sashimi. 
I don't know, it, it's like a four and a half out of five stars. Let's go for it. So as it turns out, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet, which is awesome. So I'm just gonna, <laughs> I'm just gonna have a good time. I know I didn't film much footage in there, but that place was really good. Um, they talked me into the buffet, and that was the right call. They have a sit-down menu as well, but I went for the buffet. It was great. Lots of various fried rices, regular rice, chicken, all sorts of good stuff. Highly recommend it. Uh, the last time I was here, I went to a Chinese restaurant that's actually up that street. It doesn't seem to exist anymore. Could be because of the pandemic, but it also, frankly, wasn't that great. So, But this, I recommend. So something I'd like to point out uh, about these islands, not only the CNMI, but Guam as well, that you might have noticed is it's very Asian-centric, which makes a lot of sense. That's the side of the planet that we are on. Um, but from a tourist perspective, it's actually genuinely fascinating because, uh, I'm just going to be honest, my kind, <laughs> the white devil, we are definitely the minority in these areas, which is never been a problem but it's that was how it always was even prior to the pandemic but during the pandemic we're like the only tourists and there aren't exactly a lot of us so everywhere I go it's just kind of you know odd to see me wandering around um, but that's not really the point that, that, that doesn't that's a nothing it doesn't matter it's just kind of an observation but what else is an observation is which cultures go to which island um, and just to be completely honest, while multiple can get, you know, every culture can get to either one, it seems like Japan tends to prefer Guam, and I should say maybe Guam prefers to have Japanese, while CNMI tends to prefer to have Chinese. As I mentioned earlier in the video, this is the only part of the United States where um, Chinese citizens can come to the U.S without any sort of visa. They can just land and be here. Even Guam still requires that. But, uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting, actually. So I have a friend who uh, has been sent to Guam a lot for, you know, he's been stationed there, military base, right? And he was saying one of the interesting things about that place is it's kind of a melting pot for a lot of Asian cultures. Now, I'm no expert on Asian culture, certainly, but a lot of Asian cultures don't necessarily always get along with each other. But there's kind of this understanding that when they get to Guam or they get here, you're on U.S. soil. Put all that to the side, get along, hang out, respect the red, white, and blue. Uh, that's the way it was described to me. I'm just paraphrasing and bringing that message along. But uh, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting observation. It really is. This is actually a pretty good place. My buddy Matt and I had this before. It's um, Korean hot dogs. They basically cover them in tons of different stuff. They're pretty good. So we're inside the I Love Saipan gift shop, which is the usual, like, kitschy things where everything just says I Love Saipan. And you know, we got to be careful of one of these because it's all made in the USA. But that doesn't mean it was made in Saipan. It usually means, in this case, it's either made in Guam or it's made in Hawaii or possibly the mainland. I found this amusing because this is one of those things where you never actually see this on the mainland. But this is probably the thing they think Americans do all the time. <laughs> if you're ever here, this is good stuff. The Mariana's coffee, this is actually the coffee that's grown here. Uh, it's, there's a lot of different flavors. Chocolate macadamia, that would be my favorite. Now this is the kind of thing that would be neat. This is actually produced uh, on Tinian, so this is actually from the CNMI. Uh, it's a pepper sauce. I can't bring it back because it's too much liquid, but I think that's, that's like a good gift if you were going to get somebody something. Right here is a perfect example of why this has the tourist appeal that it does. Basically, you know, this is America, technically but it saves people from across Asia from having to go all that far. So, yeah, yeah, combine all the American stuff. I mean, you pretty much can't get further from the Statue of Liberty than Saipan and still be in the U.S., man. So as I might have mentioned before, gambling is completely legal in this territory, just like the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, but because this one appeals specifically to tourists coming from Asia and how they want to hyper-focus on all things American when they get here, this is the logical result. Saipan, Vegas. Casino Hotel. Guess where I'm staying. Well, my room isn't too bad. The hotel is not amazing, but it's perfectly nice. Water bottles and everything, and it's all you need is a bed. I'm just going to sleep. They also gave me a $10 voucher to gamble, so I got 10 free dollars worth of slot machines. I know the point is to get you addicted, <laughs> but I, I don't have enough of the gambling personality for that. But I'll still play it, because what the hell. So right behind me, you can see a McDonald's. Now that may not seem all that significant, but the first time my buddy Matt and I came down here, we saw ads for it everywhere. That had just come into existence. That was Saipan's 
first McDonald's, and therefore I'm pretty sure the first McDonald's in the CNMI, and that was only a few years ago. Now they've made progress. They've got three of them. Guam made kind of the same big deal. When you land at the airport there, they have a big banner showing all the McDonald's locations. I guess nothing feels more quintessentially American than <laughs> having a McDonald's. Here we have what I'm pretty sure is a Coca-Cola bottling plant for the entirety of the Marianas, which I assume includes Guam as well. So if you've had a Coca-Cola in this part of the world, it probably came from this building. This is how we knew they were serious about McDonald's. The bus, stay, the bus stops look like this. Uh, there's a lot of them too. This is just happens to be one by the Coca-Cola factory, but this one, uh, yeah, they're all over the place. They really love the fact that they have a McDonald's. They're loving it! <laughs> okay, bye. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, on the next episode, stay tuned. I'll be heading uh, back to Guam and then uh, back to Hawaii, and uh, I'll show you a whole bunch of stuff in between. Uh, thank you very much, as always, for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you all later.